one day of uh, presentation on a uh, specific day, and the second day is uh, for uh, flat or cadaveric flat. Uh, I would like to see the same by yourself, and we will do interactive discussion later on. I'm proud to uh, uh, thank you for our uh, Something we needed to work as an orthopedic surgeon, and we agree all and proud that we are in, in need for our experience in flat to feel relief from our long limbs about bone and soft tissue defect. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, this is an honor for me to be here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fadel. Uh, when we first met in Chicago, because his, uh, his daughter uh, is uh, studying in, uh, in Chicago, it was, uh, it was during the winter, and it was a very cold day. Uh, they had the entire Michigan Avenue, which is the main avenue in Chicago, completely closed because of the ice, and, uh, and we met. Uh, he sent me a few emails. Maybe we can, maybe we can. I'm feeling really cold. I'm very, I'm sick, but let's meet. And, and uh, when we met, and at that time, that's when we decided the possibility of trying to uh, train more uh, non-plastic surgeon in, in plastic surgery. And uh, I don't have all the answers. I just don't have them. I think that what, I, what, what is working for me right now for my patients is good. Uh, I'm the last resource for all my patients at this point. Uh, thanks to the ability of combining plastic and orthopedic uh, uh, in such an early age in my career, but, but I will be 20, 20 years in my, in career, in my career, uh, I'm getting referred from all over the country. And the only thing at this point that I practice is muscle flap leg lengthening procedures and microsurgery of nerve. So I'm gonna share my experience. Uh, I'm very glad I'm very glad that someone mentioned before bone marrow aspirate as an adjunct for uh, bone healing. I use it all the time. And I think it's one of the things that need to be used more often in uh, any muscle flap is mandatory. Anyway, I'm in the uh, Department of Surgery at the St. Joseph Hospital. And uh, my emphasis is uh, on patients that are, uh, they have either a rotational problems, like in this lady, this uh, adolescent, she had uh, just performed a leg lengthening procedure and a, and a club, but the club was already corrected. And, uh, and then uh, it, the, the, yeah, the, the, the concept is trying to target and emphasize in something and try to get really good on it instead of trying to do everything. So the emphasis, I think, is what really could get your outcomes to be better at the end of the year. And it's a combination of, uh, combination of factors, but this is my humble experience. Uh, what we're trying to develop is a subspecialty on a subspecialty. It's uh, doing uh, peripheral nerve, doing muscle flap and lengthening procedures. There's a learning curve, there's a curve it, at the beginning, it's very stiff, but then all of a sudden it's going to plateau in which you, because you're going to be doing the same thing, and then it's going to get very comfortable. Uh, but then later, more difficult cases are going to come to you, and that learning curve may just go up again. It's very time consuming. It's something that I have put a lot of energy. Uh, just last year, I did 18 calibrated labs for myself, in which I'm just dissecting for myself to develop more skills. Uh, so I'm in the process now of uh, doing more uh, vascularized uh, fibular flaps and osteoperiosteal flaps. So I'm in the process of training myself into doing more. I have seen also that uh, for the most part, uh, surgeons don't like to be different. They just like to do the same thing over and over and over and when it requires something is more specialized, they may not pursue that additional training. But why, why muscle flaps? They provide the best environment for healing, the vascularity. Why tibial lengthenings? They could provide the best structure and predictable bone growth. So why are these cases not often, more often done in the non-pediatric orthopedics? And I think it's because there's no training. If there will be training for it, I think more, uh, more of these cases will be done. So, 
The question that I always tell my colleagues is why stop short in your training? Medicine should be an evolution. It should be, we continue learning every single day. And what works today may not work tomorrow. But the, the problem is, what it, is the, the problem is on the medical educators and the surgical societies. They're not embracing this. They're not embracing this concept of having a surgeon can, that can treat nerve, muscle, and bone at the same time. And why not using bone marrow aspirate? That's another one that I always tell my colleagues. Is the best way to develop angiogenesis and neovascularization. It's been proven effectively. So the muscle flaps indications that I see on my practice are several. But in the lower limb, the, uh, the peroneus brevis, go back here. In the lower limb, we have the peroneus brevis and the soleus and the reverse sural. This one, we, we're going to talk very briefly later on. I, I believe that it's, they're excellent to cover any type of metal. The, it's either a calcaneal fracture, a pylon fracture, a fibular fracture, a tibial fracture but at any level. Chronic wounds with a high incidence of patients with diabetes and pressure wounds, I think it's a viable option. And the reason why I think that muscle flap from the leg to the foot, and this is the part that you have to be very clear, you're going from large microvascular to microvascular. And I'm not a proponent of you going from micro to micro. In other words, nothing on the foot for the foot, the leg to the foot. So from my, microvascularity to micro. Also, we know for a fact that the antibiotics are best delivered by muscle. And if there's nothing that covers the muscle bone, the exposed area, antibiotics will not function. So then you end up having your infected site. So in muscle flaps are all indicated for the uh, subacute and chronic uh, osteomyelitis. In the acute process, no. But in the subacute and chronic, the answer is yes. So we could now, I'm in the process of more and more procedures in which I'm doing lengthening procedures assisted with the muscle flap. In other words, to speed up the healing uh, capability in patients that are, either they have a history of smokers, uh, patients with diabetes, uh, patients with, uh, they've been uh, taking steroids, patients that are impaired, how to accelerate their healing potential. And I think the muscle flap becomes a very good viable option. Any time that you have the feeling uh, that there's going to be some problem with wound coverage, I believe the muscle flap will be a good indication. And this is a very practical lecture, uh, tips and pearls, that it will give you some uh, good start and good ideas of how to proceed with muscle flap. I do not want to turn this lecture into a, a, a research lecture or a, uh, an analysis of what is really have been documented. This is just my personal my personal uh, opinion and experience. So this, this diagram right here, that's basically the type two is the back of the leg and the lateral compartment. So the entire posterior compartment, the superficial and deep, is basically a state uh, type two. And the type four is basically the anterior compartment. So the only thing you need to remember is the type two and type four. Why? Because Type two the type two you can see here in the diagram that it has a large vessel proximal. The ones these go are smaller, smaller pedicle. So this muscle always is gonna function better going this way. It's always gonna go do better going from distal to proximal. The one in the type four, they're all similar pedicles. That's basically your anterior tibial, your extensor digitorium, your extensor hallucis. All of them are gonna be type four. So that one could be rotated proximally, distally also, but the, it will be the same ratio of success. So when not to do flaps? Let's try to keep it very simple, because it could get very complicated and, uh, during the, uh, the break. Uh, I mentioned that how do we know that we have 
multiple options and sometimes we can be more confused about what to do is when you have lean reconstructive surgeons in an audience. If you will be a sports medicine audience, it's very simple. It's basically ligament repair or cartilage repair. So if you don't have no vascularity, you cannot do a muscle flap. And if the patient doesn't meet criteria for anesthesia, either is not a candidate for a muscle flap. So what is the worst case scenario in some of my patients? Is that I will have a residual wound that I have to treat with another muscle flap, or that wound now is more superficial and it will heal faster. The second scenario is that the patient will end up with a below knee amp or an above knee amp amputation with the patient already know and is uh, in, uh, informed about it. And the patient has been referred to me as an alternative to an amputation. So at this point is the last option, which is gonna be your case when you are uh, treating these cases. So these are the flap courses. I, I definitely think that it, try to do as many flap courses as possible. Try to embrace them. I, every time I go to the lab, I like to do at least six hours of dissection. Get familiarized, open the, the anatomy book, read your anatomy and read your, where is the vascularity in the limb? And the whole key is about how to recognize and identify on the limbs or to perforators. Perforator means the vascularity to the, to the foot. <coughs> Planning is everything, and this is just a Calvary representation of the lab, which I perform. And you can see the muscle flap was used to cover the knee. It was cover the diaphyseal area. It was cover the medial, malleolar, and ankle also. And uh, anterior and this one. So the muscle flap can cover any, any wound in the lower leg. There's no need to do a fascial cutaneous flap. Muscle is the most important. The cutaneous flaps are very temperamental. I call it temperamental, it means that in best hands, 50% of the time are gonna fail. And that's according to Duke University, which in my opinion, they, they have the best plastic department in, uh, in the US. So this is just a calibrated kind of representation of, uh, of the muscle flap. You can see in the, in the screen, that's the soleus laterally. It's a lateral soleus. You can, see you can cover multiple segments on the lower limb. You can cover the anterior portion. You can cover the posterior heel. Uh, this is the flexor hallucis right behind the fibula. This is the peroneus longus. And we're gonna go into details on the, on the videos uh, later on. This is the reverse row flap. Is is called is a cutaneous adipo because it has fat, and then it has the fascia. So it could, this is the skin, adipo tissue, and then the fascia over the muscle. So it could be done with or without the fascia. So it could be only called cutaneous adipo or cutaneous adipo fascia. Is the fascia on top of the gastrocnemius? Not, it's not, it's a, this is a, 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 a flap, and it's not a muscle flap. And these are the reason why muscle flap have, uh, flaps have a bad reputation, is because most people try to attempt cutaneous flaps. So what I'm advocating is muscle flap, not cutaneous, in the lower limb, especially when the vascularity is not adequate. So this is a reverse row flap, I, I call it very temperamental. It had to be always delayed, means that you're not gonna do the full transposition immediately. It's two inches from the posterior knee fold. The pedicle size is very important to be more than two centimeters. The size of the pedicles, I have clearance of 1.5, and in all muscle flaps, you have to do drains. <coughs> this is a, a a reverse row flap, that's me in the OR. Uh, an external fixator was applied. And you can see the, the length of the uh, incision to cover from the uh, defect in the plantar aspect of the foot. And uh, you can see on the right here that it's, it's time to pray. It's time to pray 
because uh, this, the, the cutaneous portion of it is not, is not uh, going very well. And these are the things that it could happen. The patient laid on uh, went from here to here and it healed. This is a patient that had uh, an infected tibial nail and uh, we were able to save uh, the patient's limb. Uh, but the, uh, the reverse of uh, was not completely successful. This is the way that it looks the, uh, the donor side and after the skin graft. This is, a, this is basically what I call in the U.S. a home run baseball. The home run muscle flap. This is a bronchial brevis. You can transpose right here to the dorsum of the foot. It can go to the posterior heel. It can cover, of course, the fibula. It can cover the anterior. And also, this is a, uh, a surgical exposure and a coverage of the calcaneus planale with the peroneus brevis. So it will give you coverage to the calcaneal area also. So what is the criteria for the peroneal brevis flap? You need to have blood flow of the peroneal artery. You have to have adequate lateral soft tissue uh, coverage. And uh, this is the product that I use. So the muscle cannot just left and not cover. It has to be covered with something. If not, the muscle is going to die. So my proposed uh, product is the Integra, which the, the vendors are outside, and we're going to be using at the at the university uh, during the surgeries. This is a, a short video that you can see of the peroneal brevis. Um, this is uh, what we're seeing here. This is the uh, fibular head about three centimeters distally, the common peroneal is in that area, so you have to be very careful. That's the fibular tip, about seven centimeters. Right here is where those last perforators are gonna be. This is the uh, peroneal longus, and the peroneal brevis is right underneath. This is the lateral compartment of the leg. The retraction of the peroneal longus, and the peroneal brevis is deflected from the posterior aspect of the uh, of the peroneal longus. So this is the muscle that we want. This one right here. That's the brevis, and it sits on top of the fibula. That's the anterior compartment to the leg. That's a common peroneal nerve. <clears throat> that nerve is a very important nerve, as we know is a com the component nerve, it gets traumatized a lot with the use of uh, external fixation and a portion of my practice is, is basically reconstructing the component nerve in cases that they have had external, external fixators. So the reason why I, I, this is a cadaveric uh, picture, what you're seeing here, this is the, su the superficial peroneal nerve. These are muscular branches to the peroneus longus. These are branches to the uh, peroneus longus also anteriorly. And this segment right here is going underneath the septum that is into the anterior compartment. So this is the deep peroneal portion of the common peroneal, and this is the superficial. Superficial will enervate the entire lateral compartment of the leg. The common peroneal is going underneath to the anterior compartment. This branch right here, the, there's a, this branch goes to the muscular area. This one right here in the back is it goes and merge with the medial branch of the of the tibial nerve, which is going to combine to the sural nerve. So that's a, just a quick a quick. Uh, this is the peroneal brevis again, reflecting the peroneal brevis, and that's the, the fibular ch uh, chaff. And at this point, you can see reflection of the bronchus brevis. This is a cadaveric uh, representation. Some cadavers, they have more beefy uh, legs, and they're a lot easier to, that's a perforator at that, at that point. This is a, a, a pediatric patient that uh, I performed uh, bronchus brevis lab with an acute shortening of the talectomy. Uh, this child was involved in a, in a motorcycle accident. Uh, but when do we do the reverse solutes? It's a more robust. So you need more muscle than the gravis and more surface. Think about the solutes instead of the uh, instead of the gravis. So what, what is the criteria for the solutes? 
the posterior tibia is the vascularity to the soleus, the bronchial artery is the vascularity to remember is what is really the vascularity and vascularity is uh, pretty much everything in the this is a, a patient that had a, a, a lateral calcaneal fracture with the hardware was exposed with osteomyelitis of the, of the, of the foot. Uh, the lateral soleus, you can see it right here. That's a, the soleus muscle give you more, more substance, more, more coverage, it's, it's thicker. That's uh, after the coverage of the, uh, the wound with the muscle flap. You can see it, the wound is completely covered. This patient had the, the wound exposed for a period of three months and uh, not healing. So when the wounds are not healing, it's time for a muscle flap. Uh, and the is application of the external fixator. This is uh, uh, a very, very important part. That's the reason why I think that limb reconstructive PSR surgeons are the best surgeons to be trained in muscle flap because external fixation is part of it. And motion is the enemy of a muscle flap. And that's the, the important thing. Don't trust a posterior spleen. Don't trust a cast. An external fixator is the only answer here. And it has to be applied. It could be any type of device, but any motion will be detrimental for the first three days. This is a, a cadaveric representation of a wound medially. In the, uh, here we can see this is a patient with a wound medially, and in the cadaver, I perform a medial soleus lab, and the same wound could be covered with the soleus. So you, in the cadaver lab, you can pretty much practice the type of surgeries that you're gonna do. That's one of the biggest advantages of cadaver dissection. This is uh, the soleus flap. And what you're seeing is the incision on the medial side of the leg. That's the, the medial aspect of the tibia. That's the notch, that's the same area where you would do a proximal tibial osteotomy. At this point, what you see in this is the gastronemius. The soleus is right on top of it. This is the fascia to the posterior compartment of the leg. That's the soleus. And reflecting the gastronemius inferiorly, leaving the soleus completely uh, exposed. And it had to be reflected from the posterior side of the gastrointestinal. <coughs> you can see on this is another calibrated representation. The soleus completely dissected from the gastrointestinal. This is a fascia release to be, be able to separate the soleus from the gastrointestinal. And once the dissection is done, you can appreciate the amount of muscle that you will get to be able to cover and rotate any defect in the foot, it could in the mid foot, in the tibia, even into the posterior heel, and that same muscle could be rotated into this area. So that would be what is a, a, hemi, a hemisoleus approach. This is a, big, uh, a patient, a 66-year-old, in which I was involved to help one of my uh, colleagues in the hospital, infected uh, and uh, total knee arthroplasty two weeks with, uh, treated with MRSA. Uh, it was explanted, additional debridement, and it was uh, back for eight weeks. A post soleus and a gastro flap on the knee was uh, used, and a uh, fusion with the integral matrix and back. And this is the, the surgical, uh, what you see here is an acute shortening with a fusion. The external fixator was applied to prevent any motion plus refusion. Um, here you can see the rotation of the gastro over the, uh, over the knee. 
and then also a portion of the soleus to cover a wound in the back of the of the uh, heel cord. And this is the patient two weeks out in the process of healing. At that point, it's not a it's not a limb salvage case anymore. It's a case of just wound, wound management. This is the uh, AP and lateral the fusion. I'm gonna jump into this. We're gonna go over these videos later on. So what is it will be a difficult scenario? Difficult scenario will be that the posterior tibia is occluded. So that means the soleus muscle cannot be used, uh, it cannot be used immediately. But if you order an angiogram, the angiogram can allow you to see if there's any perforators coming from the peroneal artery to the soleus, which it could happen. So in those cases, the fibula uh, diaphysectomy could be done, and the brevis, the peroneal brevis, could be transferred from lateral to medial. And the soleus can be also transferred from medial to lateral. So these are the two big muscles that I believe that everybody should know, is the peroneal brevis and the soleus, because the soleus gives you the lateral soleus, and it gives you also the medial side. These are the protocols, and I, I like to say avoid deviating from them, adequate blood flow and angiogram uh, prior to surgery, in the OR, the use of doppers. You want to have that doppler. You want to be sure that if you pull the muscle, you have enough vascularity. You don't want to use uh, a tourniquet. Why? Because you want to see the muscle if it's bleeding at all time, and that's, that's extremely important. The bone marrow aspirate is very, I think it's essential for the donor site and uh, a poor plasma uh, platelet, a very rich in fibrinogen, and that's ex essential for hemostasis of the area and pain management also. The flaps, they have to be stabilized with an external fixation at all times. And this is, uh, I like to say that I, I always use adaptive. I don't know if that product is here in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, Dr. Fado, is that product here in adaptive? It's a, it's a non-adhesive dressing. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, many of... Uh, uh, Petrolatum base. Of the coverage, we are not oriented by that because most of the, uh, these uh, products related to plastic surgery. I see. Uh, so that would be something that the, the adequate dressing to have to apply over the muscle flap is very important. Anyone has any experience with a wound back? A back? Yes, wound back, yes. Yes. Vacuum. The vacuum, yeah. So the back, I use the back uh, a, a lot of times also. So I aspirate 30 cc from bone marrow from the proximal tibia, 30 cc of peripheral blood, and I combine that. And that will give you a lot of platelet poor just to, for hemostasis and payment. And this is just uh, in the OR doing the bone marrow aspect. It's very simple for the proximal, proximal uh, medial face of the tibia. We know that that's an area of excellent bone regenerate. I tried to after about 30 cc's. And uh, you will uh, combine that with uh, peripheral blood flow, peripheral venous uh, blood. This is uh, applying the bone marrow aspirate with a calcium thrombin to the muscle flap. This is a patient that at the same time a, a distal tibia uh, domal steatomy was performed because the foot was in severe pairs and skin graft was applied. And that's in the, what is called the second stage. This patient, the muscle flap was done perf uh, first then the integra uh, matrix was applied. Once that granulates and the muscle flap is secure, then the split thickness skin graft is applied over the air. This is a picture of in the OR uh, for a prominent brevis flap to cover anterior tibia for an exposed pylon fracture. Uh, and you can see that it's about seven centimeters from the fibular tip 
and this is where you want to listen for the doubler sound. You can see that the muscle is bleeding and there's ad uh, adequate uh, transposition of the pronoun phrase. This is an intraoperative uh, picture of how it looks the pronoun brevis is impregnated with the bone marrow aspect. It will control the hemostasis. <clears throat> this is a prior to the application of the wound back. The next step will be application of the external fixator. There's many ways to apply an external fixator to protect the muscle flap. In this particular case, uh, I create like a bar in the house and the bottom part to protect a, a solid flap for the uh, calcaneum. The uh, post-op, the dressing change, it doesn't get touched for two up days. Very important, the wound back negative pressure, if needed, will be applied if they have excessive uh, drainage. The fixator usually gets removed in three weeks unless there is another orthopedic condition treated at the same time. And then I like to transition all these patients to a, a brace, a custom-made brace, uh, with or without a, a hinge at the level of the ankle to control and prevent some of the various deformity that could, could happen. This is the, uh, a case on a club foot uh, with a derotation of the of the tibia in which uh, the scar was completely removed from the medial side from the prior posterior medial re releases and the integral matrix was used successfully. <coughs> so the steps, it could always, the muscle fat could always be lightly debrided. You can use also another process for the thin skin. It's a very thin skin matrix by Integra. And then apply immediately the soft tissue skin graft. And the settings are 0 0.018 for most, uh, almost all the time. Uh, very important with the vacuum, never go anywhere above 75. This lecture, I will give this lecture to Dr. Fader so he can pass this lecture to you if you need it. This is a patient had an ankle replacement which failed. Uh, these are very popular procedures in the US, leaving an anterior wound, which I covered uh, with a uh, brownish brevis flap. In the process, I had some dehiscence of the donor side. Uh, in this particular case, I used Integra matrix just to cover the tendon and a split thickness skin graft over the muscle. And this is the same patient 15 days later, six weeks uh, post. This is uh, the last case. This is a peroneal, uh, reverse peroneal muscle flap and a patient with sharp arthropathy had uh, exposed hardware. Patient developed a fistula, non-infected fistula due to uh, irritation of a brace. There was no infection. This is the incision approach to harvest the bronchial gravis. In a patient like that that has such a big leg, big leg, a stack of big muscle. <laughs> so when they have big leg, big muscles, and big muscles heal everything very fast. And in this particular case, you can see the bronchial gravis in my hand covering the, the, the wound over the plate. So if the plate is stable, there's no uh, motion through the fusion site, the best way to uh, heal that area is just providing vascularity with the muscle flap. The plate layer on, layer on to be removed is needed percutaneously. This is an uh, application of the bone marrow aspirate. This is what is called the tunneling technique. It's rerouting the muscle, leaving the, the skin between the wound, the, the distance from here to the beginning of my incision cannot be less than three centimeters. Very, very important. If it's less than three centimeters, this area here can be cross. So it, that's very, very important to remember. This is rerouting of the muscle, cover of the wound. You suture the area with fibro uh, vitro very light stitch, just a few stitches. This is applying the bone marrow aspirate with the PPP into the uh, wound to control hemostasis and pain. 
this is a, the, the wound closure is very important. So drains at all time, and then wound closure and uh, with some retention, you're avoiding some tension from the skin edges. This could be done with these uh, clips, or you can use uh, uh, basically staples, and these are just what is called uh, vessel loops. And this is the patient's x-ray, the fixator was applied. This is the patient on uh, the initial 12 days. And then this is the final, the final outcome. And this is the patient uh, <coughs> final appearance. The patient had the same condition in both uh, limbs. And uh, if you could work for a patient like him, that you know that this is a patient for sure, it's not gonna run the Chicago Marathon, a, it, the muscle flap could be used for pretty much anything. Because this is a patient with diabetes that are, these are the most difficult patients to heal. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you, Dr. Fada. Thank you for having me here. That the uh, peroneus brevis, right about two centimeters from the fibular tip, proximal, it kind of forks anteriorly and it merged with the anterior tibial. Actually, it merged with the lateral malleolar vessel. So you have the peroneus brevis go through the lateral malleolar vessel to the anterior tibial. So may not be a complete reconstitution of the vessel, but that may be enough that you can pull the peroneal brevis. I would not do anything on the anterior compartment. So the, the answer will be either lateral compartment or posterior compartment. Do you have tried the uh, from the femoral artery in case of entry of the anterior femoral artery? Could, you may take the softness mm -hmm. and yeah. make a femoral could be from the femoral. Yes, that's at the same time. Excellent way. The best way to do a muscle flap after revascularization is the same day that the revascularization is done. So, because the vascular surgeon has already that area exposed for the conduit, so then at that point, then you rotate your muscle to cover the wound and then close everything. I, and then applying all the external fixator immediately. Yeah, but that would be, you see, now uh, there's a new movement in the U.S. of vascular surgeons getting trained also in muscle flap, and it's for that same reason. But then they will call you to apply the external fixator. So I'm helping some surgeons also on that aspect of it. 